Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Kimberly Crenshaw's notion of intersectionality. Now I've done an episode on the essay that this comes from, and you can go check that out if you want. But this will be a little bit more of a concise thing about the term specifically. Now before jumping into that, if you want to follow me any, anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy, or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows, they might get a kick out of it. Uh, if you want to help me out, do all those things. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal if you're interested in that at all, but obviously no pressure. If you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video on YouTube. Or if you found me on YouTube, you're going to be able to find this in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts. So don't want to waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's jump into this very important term uh, that Crenshaw gives us. And I would like to say there is a, a longer history here with this term that traces back to certain uh, African feminist philosophers in certain African settings that I'm, I don't know the whole history of, but just focusing today on how Crenshaw deploys it and what motivated her to think about this term and to really bring it into the spotlight. Now, Crenshaw was trained as uh, a lawyer. She went, to, she went to law school, and this really informs her understanding of intersectionality because she developed this idea upon looking at various court cases in which she recognized the law deployed what she called a single access framework to understanding discrimination. So she says that this legal system was unable to understand the possibility that, and these are the cases that she looked at, that black women would be experiencing discrimination in a way that was different from white women and black men. So according to the legal framework, people could only be discriminated against based on gender or race, not a mix of both. Now to demonstrate this, she looks at three different court cases. I'm not gonna go into detail about them here. I've covered them in a lot more detail in that other episode I did on the entire essay. So I'm gonna be quite brief about it here. But in each of the cases, black women brought forward complaints that their employers were discriminating against them based off the fact that they were black women, not that they were black or women, but that it was because of a mix of both. But to this, the court said, well, we cannot grant black women special privileges because they aren't a recognized category within the judicial framework. So in order for a complaint to be brought forward, a complaint of discrimination, what the black women had to do who were bringing forward these cases was had to prove that there was discrimination based off of gender and that there was discrimination based off of race. But the problem with that was that when they actually researched this, they found that looking at gender, white women were doing very well. So they could then not say that gender was a basis of discrimination that the employer was using. Likewise, they couldn't prove that race was actually a determining factor of discrimination or race was being discriminated against because black men were doing particularly well in these industries as well. But looking at all the data that they were presenting, black women were being continually refused positions in authority. They would be treated with hostility in ways that white women and black men were not. And so they were looking at these facts and saying like, there is something going on here. There's something going on that is specific to the experiences of black women, at least how they are being treated within these industries that cannot be understood in terms of these single axis frameworks of either race-based discrimination or gender-based discrimination. Now the immediate issue with the single axis framework is that it sets the most privileged groups within any given group. It sets the most privileged group as the standard. So in the case of gender, white women are the standard. So if white women are doing well, then that's fine. Then there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. There's no proof that could be mounted then that gender-based discrimination is occurring. But as these women brought forward, black women were being discriminated against, but that wasn't taken seriously because black women weren't understood to be a category that could experience discrimination differently from black men or white women. Another difficulty that these black women faced was in attributing a certain arithmetic to this discrimination. So one of the things that they confronted was the fact that, or brought forward, was the fact that black women experienced discrimination greater than the sum of the parts of that discrimination. 
So if we're just using gender and race here, these black women were bringing forward the case that the discrimination that they were experiencing was greater than just gender-based and race-based discrimination combined. It was something more than that, which was just beyond the comprehension of the judicial system. They just could not comprehend this possibility that the sum was greater than its part. So in many of these cases, I believe two of the three, these women's cases were just thrown out of court because they, there was no basis with it. Just because the judicial system did not have the capacity to recognize how differently situated people can experience discrimination differently. So, and this extends much further than this as well, beyond race and gender, to class as well, to sexuality and so on. These are all elements that can be discriminated against and that have been proven, have been proven time and time again to be sites of discrimination, but they're only ever taken as single things, not as possibly existing in conjunction with other forms of oppression that make that oppression much worse than the sum of its parts. So part of her essay, and what is really profound about it, is developing an approach to understanding discrimination in a way that moves beyond the single axis framework, one that takes intersectionality as its basis, that is able to consider all of these different forces, or at least try to, because there's no way to really quantify them entirely, but to begin opening that discussion into how these things can be accounted for. And yeah, that's more or less it in very short form. I've done a like I said, I've done the longer episode on the entire essay. If you're interested in that, you can go check it out. If there's anything I excluded just about the term itself, or if anyone knows more about its history, I'd love to hear about it. Or if there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Or if you like what I did, like, share, tell your friends who knows they might get a kick out of it. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. Take care.